What's up guys and welcome back to Monique. If you guys are new here then what is up? My name is Erica. Heya. How you doing? And if you're into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe, maybe you're just here to see how the Iliad ends. If that sounds like you, you guys are going to want to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so that you know every single time I post in the future. But, as I just said, today's episode will be going into book 24 of Homer's Iliad, so why don't we just roll right into it. If I could summarize book 24 into one sentence, it would be that Priam goes to get Hector's body back. That's the most important thing, that is the most important thing in an academic sense, not just in a me sense, that it is that Priam goes all the way to Achilles' camp to beg for his son's body back, which is genuinely one of the most famous moments in all of mythology. So I'm really gonna be focusing on that. It is not a very long book. It's not a very long chapter. It's certainly one of the longer ones, but in comparison to book 23, holy crap, this is a piece of cake. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna start talking now. The book opens with all of the men scattering after the funeral games from last book. As we remember, there were funeral games for Patroclus. Now that's all over. And so all the men scatter, they then go to bed, they eat, they do all that sort of like nighttime routine thing. And they are all sound asleep because it's the end of the day. And everybody in the camp is asleep aside from Achilles. Achilles is obviously, obviously the only person who's wide awake and that's because he is still so upset that Patroclus is dead. Like literally this man is described as like tossing and turning. He goes to the beach to pace at one point. He even like lies on his face in bed crying. Like that is how upset he is. So like this idea, like genuinely like this idea that they weren't in love, like nobody would have this reaction if they were not in love. Like come on, this sounds a lot like love to a lot of people, even though I have tried to be apart from the last book. I've tried to be very much just like, this is one way of looking at it. This is what the Greek says. This is 100% these men were in love. This is 100% a relationship. This is how you would mourn this if the love of your life died. Like that is what Achilles is doing. And in fact, Achilles is so so upset by this, like he is so upset by Patroclus' death that as soon as dawn rolls around, he actually gets into his chariot, he straps Hector's body back to his chariot again, and then he drives Hector's body around Patroclus' tomb three times just because he can't get over this. And I don't think that's gonna make him feel any better, like he's been doing this for days now, and yet he still doesn't feel any better. So poor Hector's body, but like that is what Achilles is doing. Achilles drives back to the camp, he then unclasps Hector's body from the chariot, and then he's just sort of like, him in the dust again. But again, Apollo feels really, really bad that Hector is being treated this way. So Apollo is constantly protecting Hector's body from, you know, being gross and shriveled and just like shred to pieces. As Achilles continues to rage on though, the gods are actually now starting to try and convince Hermes to go down and to get Hector's body because they're like, this is getting out of hand. You need to go and handle this. But obviously most of the gods, most of them agree with this aside from Hera, Poseidon and Athena. And Homer stresses that the reason why they are still keeping their hatred of the Trojans well and alive at this point is because of the judgment of Paris. That is insane to me. Genuinely, the fact that they are still harping on this like one time that they gave Paris a golden apple and he favored Aphrodite, like they're still holding on to that. This is a whole new level of grudge because that is why they are still not like letting up even slightly to the Trojans even after seeing Hector's body be treated this way they're just like no Paris was a dick that one time and so Hector has to suffer and you're like wow get over it and this is very important to remember considering that now it is 12 days after Hector has been killed. So it's now been 12 days of Achilles constantly riding around Patroclus' tomb and all of this sort of stuff. So now Apollo speaks to all the gods. Apollo is like, enough is enough. Apollo highlights to all of the gods that Hector has been nothing but nice to them, like literally his entire life. He did nothing but give offerings to them, give sacrifices to them. He never forgot a single one of them. And yet now they won't even do him the courtesy of like making sure that his body could go back to Troy so that, you know, his family, his friends, uh, his wife, his mother, his parents, like none of them can bury him now, even though he has been literally a like model citizen. He says it's ridiculous that they are favoring Achilles right now, considering he is a man that doesn't understand justice. That's something that Apollo highlights, that like he's so hell bent set on this this sadness that he has and this emotion. And Apollo is just like, look, he's gonna be losing people who are closer to him one day. He's gonna be losing his father. He's gonna lose his son. And yet when that happens, most people just sort of like cry about it and they get over it. And Achilles is still harping on Patroclus. He needs to get over it and his dumb fury. Hera then gets mad, obviously Hera gets mad, and she starts telling all of the other gods that the reason why Achilles is favored so much is because he is the son of a goddess. She highlights again that it's Thetis, and she says that she herself actually helped 
to raise Thetis when she was a really, really young newborn goddess. And she's so close with Thetis, which is, this is a really nice little, little piece of information, that Hera actually gave her away on her wedding day to Peleus. And she's like, hello, you were all there. Do we not remember how I am literally like this girl's mother? Of course I'm gonna be looking out for her son, you dummy Apollo. Hera's rage then prompts Zeus to get involved and Zeus is just like, all right, simmer down. You don't have to yell at everybody. Like, please calm down Hera. However, he does also say that he loved Hector. He says in this moment to all the other gods, like Hector was really one of the best men. I loved him in particular because he never forgot me and he never forgot sacrifices to me, which obviously Zeus has to make it about him because it's Zeus. But he also doesn't like the idea that everybody's asking Hermes to go and steal the body because he says that's stupid. Thetis is always down there with Achilles and bear in mind that Zeus and he says to all of them, I want to honor the deal that I made with Thetis. I also want to give Achilles the time to, you know, mourn and to have this moment and to let out his anger. That is very important for somebody who is as angry as Achilles. Remember that the story begins, the whole poem begins with the rage of Achilles. Like <laughs> this is a very famous rage that Zeus is now just like, we need to allow him to have this moment. But he does end it by saying that he wants one of the gods to go and to summon Thetis to him so that he can tell her that he's going to have Priam make up a little like ransom for Hector's body, go to Achilles and he wants, like Zeus wants Achilles to accept the ransom uh, from Priam. Now our lovely messenger god Iris has been sitting in the corner and she hears all of this and she goes, yep, no problem, I got it. And she plummets down into the sea, she goes to find Thetis and Thetis is currently sitting in this like room in the bottom of the sea in like some cave and she's crying because Achilles is about to die and so all of the other sea goddesses are now around Thetis and they're all crying for the future death of Achilles. And so Iris awkwardly has to interrupt this. The poor goddess is always interrupting these like very awkward scenarios being like, <laughs> So sorry. She does this though to Thetis and she comes in and she's like, I'm really sorry to interrupt, but like I need you to get your shit together because Zeus wants to talk to you. And Thetis turns around to her and Thetis is just like, excuse you, can't you see I'm busy? And then she pauses for a moment. They cry a little bit more and then she turns around. And she's like, all right, fine, I'll come. Only because it's Zeus. If it was any other god, I wouldn't be coming, but fine, it's Zeus, I will come. So Iris then takes Thetis to Olympus and when Thetis arrives at Olympus, she is given this goblet of like gold wine because she does. She does not look so good after all the crying. Hera gives her this goblet of wine, Thetis accepts it. And then she goes to sit next to Zeus because Zeus, you know, passed the seat next to him and is like, Thetis, come over here. So she goes to sit next to him and Athena makes way for her. So it's now that Zeus explains in this moment that the gods have been arguing for nine days. They've been arguing for nine days about Hector's body and about the treatment of Hector. And so he tells her that, and he says, look, what I really just need you to do is I need you to go down to Achilles and tell him that none of us are happy with him and none of us are happy with the way that he is treating this body. So Zeus tells Thetis to tell him that, but to also tell him that he must accept when Priam comes to the camps, he must accept the ransom and that he must, you know, be willing to hand over Hector because he's had his fun, okay? They're highlighting this, that Achilles has had his way, they've given him enough time, now he has to get over it. Thetis hears this and she says, yep, no problem. And so she goes down to Achilles' camp and she actually finds him when they are getting food ready. So Achilles is like making all these sacrifices and all of this to like eat. And then Thetis goes down and she basically just relays everything that Zeus has said. Uh, to her so that we hear this all again. And she's like, you absolutely 100% have to give the body of Hector back when Priam arrives with all of the ransoms. Like this is very, very important. It's also important that he does this because she highlights to him that his destiny is fast approaching. She's like, I don't have a lot of time left with you. You're gonna die soon. And this is what you have to do in order to make yourself like a little bit redeemable. So like do it. And then Achilles is like, okay, fine. But I'm only saying fine to giving back Hector's body because Zeus has requested it. And he said, if any other God was requesting this, I would say no. But because it's Zeus, I say, okay. As our lovely mother and son duo continue to talk over food, we actually cut back to Zeus, who is on Olympus and he tells Iris to go down to Priam and to tell Priam to get a ransom together for Hector's body. Because bear in mind, Priam is not coming up with this idea by himself. Okay, the gods have willed this. So Iris is like, sure, no problem. She then goes down to Troy and she finds everybody in the city still mourning. She goes down to the palace and Priam and his family are like, definitely in questionable positions. Like all the women are like pulling out their hair and Priam himself is like covered in like dung apparently. Like he is huh, not dealing with this so well. But Iris isn't really phased by this and she goes to stand next to him. She like, you know, makes herself kind of invisible so that nobody else is staring at her. And she basically whispers to Priam, like he's sort of standing there and she's like whispering into his ear. So his whole body is like shivering because he's like, the oh, f is this thing happening to me? And so she tells him, you can only go with one herald. She says that's super important. You go with one herald only, you get a wagon full of things and the herald is only there so that you have helped to bring Hector's body back because you will get it. She 
wants to make him feel very, very confident in this moment by telling him like, you will succeed in the task that I'm giving you because the gods have willed that you will succeed in doing it, if that makes sense. She then leaves and Priam then tells all of his sons to start getting a wagon ready. He relays what he's just heard and he's just like, okay, all of you help me get this wagon and chariot thing ready. That would be helpful. And in this moment, whilst they're all doing that, he himself goes down to the storeroom because he's gonna gather up all of the uh, ransom for Hector's body. But he goes to find Hecuba, his wife, and she's the only person he wants to speak to. And so he relays, again, <laughs> he relays what we've heard from the gods, what we've heard from Iris, what we've heard from all these different people about what he has to do and asks Hecuba what she thinks he should do. So he says, you know, do you think I should go? And Hecuba turns around to him and is like, what the f is wrong with you that you think you're gonna go to the Greek camps by yourself to get our son's body back? Are you insane? Hecuba also says what I think is one of the most important lines from her character in the story, because she doesn't really have that many moments, and yet she has a moment here, so I obviously, obviously made a note of the line. So the line is 212 to 213, where she says, I wish I could set teeth in the middle of Achilles's liver and eat it. Like that tells you how much this woman hates Achilles. So obviously when Priam is like, I'm gonna go and say hi to Achilles, she's like, no. Not that Priam actually listens to her, so I don't really know why he's asking for her advice because he basically says, don't hold me back because I know that a god is protecting me. However, he does say that even though he has seen Iris, even though Iris herself has told him to go do this, if it is his destiny to die by Achilles' sword when he's in the Greek camps, then let it happen. He says, that's fine with me as long as I go and I try because this is what the gods have told me to do. Priam then gathers up this as the ransom. I could not remember what the whole ransom is because it is so much it's insane and then he goes back up to where the whole wagon situation is loads it all up in the wagon and then he basically tells all the trojans to leave him alone because he's like you can all go and mourn at home i'm busy right now is it not enough that literally the gods and achilles has taken my best son you can't give me a inch right now and in fact some of them don't leave so Priam like goes after them with a stick he just comes after them with like a really sharp stick and he's like F off go home and so then they all sort of do go home and he's just left with his sons and his family uh, in in the house as he's like you know still getting ready now this is my favorite part of the final book like <laughs> we're not even most of the way through but this is my favorite part that there are nine sons of Priam around him and he basically scolds all of them in the moment right and he just tells them off and then he gives them all orders to do in order to help him get ready to go and get Hector he says in this moment that he wishes he could have died in place of Hector and he also lists off three sons including Hector who Ares have taken from him so aside from Hector there was also Mester who was literally not important at all and the last one is Troilus and that is the character that Shakespeare then picks up on to write an entire play about, which God knows why, but he did. So that those are the three, even that. <laughs> those are the three that Priam highlights that Ares has taken from him. And he's so upset by this because he says that the gods have left him only with his disgraceful sons. And bear in mind, they're all standing around him. So he says that the gods have left him only with the most disgraceful of his sons, including the dancers, the champions of the chorus, and the liars. And I would just like to highlight right now that Paris is still alive. <laughs> and that's why this is my favorite part, that he doesn't go, oh, all of my great sons have died. At least I still have Paris. He's like, you're all useless and Paris is there and I love it. And as they're all listening to the speech, they've obviously like all stopped and they're just like, uh, okay, dad. And then he turns around, notices that they've all stopped working. And so he's like, get back to work, get my freaking wagon ready. And so then they all sort of like scattering at the wagon ready. And then there's this really long description of what they do to the wagon to get it ready. And what the, you know, like goes in the wagon and all of this. I'm not including all of that because it is long. Now that all of the wagon preparations are done though, Hecuba actually comes up to Priam who's sort of like about to mount into the chariot. And she says, look, I totally understand that you want to go and get Hector's body. You know, I've accepted that you're gonna go do it anyways, but what I'm going to encourage is that you make a sacrifice. Well, you make an offering right now, not a sacrifice. She wants him to make an offering of wine, which she's holding this like goblet of wine. She's like, make this as an offering to Zeus and ask him that if he's going to be with you on this journey, he will send a bird omen uh, right now from the sky. And if he doesn't send the bird omen, please don't go. And so Priam's like, all right, fine, I'll do it. So he first of all has to like rinse off his hands with water and then he does make this wine offering. And then Zeus hearing this, seeing this, he sends down a huge eagle down to Troy so they can see like, here's the bird. You literally cannot miss it. Like that is the point of it. And so this huge eagle comes down and Priam is like, dope, I'ma go. Priam and his little herald who is I, mm, Ideos? We've mentioned him before 
before and I still did not know how to pronounce his name then, still don't know how to do it now. But that guy who has popped up in the story before, he is the herald who's gonna go with Priam. So they both get in the chariot and as they're leaving Troy, then we have all of the, all of the citizens of Troy really who are like walking with them and lamenting with them as they get to the gate. They then go through the gate, all of the lamenters and mourners, they go back to their homes and Priam and Id Idaios, whatever the f his name is, they then start riding out and they get all the way to a river quite far out until they stop because now the horses are like super tired, night is falling and so Priam is like, all right, you know, the horses should like drink something first. We should chill out for a hot second. We'll just take a moment to pause. It's in this pause that they actually see in the darkness, there's somebody who's coming towards them. Now they don't know that it's Hermes, right? We know that it's Hermes because Homer tells us it's Hermes who's gonna come and help Priam now get to the Greek ships, which we know, okay? We knew that all this was gonna happen. We know that this is now Hermes' role. He is going to act as a guide in order to make sure that the Greeks do not see Priam as he comes into the camps because that would just be bad, okay? This is, that would not be a good situation. So Hermes is now going to keep him safe, but Priam does not know that it's Hermes. It just looks like a rando dude because he has taken on, Hermes has taken on the guise of this just like young man. Priam's herald sees this guy coming towards them and is like, ha, huh, we should like, run away and Priam he's sort of like rooted to the ground so he doesn't actually move and it gives Hermes enough time to gain his ground to then come over to the two men. Hermes then approaches them and he opens up with basically saying where are you guys going like it's super late you guys are old you're not exactly in like fighting condition so what are you doing out here considering Priam looks like an old aged father and a beloved old aged father and that's what he opens with which I think is like quite funny considering they're literally in the middle of nowhere and Hermes is just like what the f are you guys up to? Priam then says hey yeah we're just like out here because God is on my side so it's fine and I feel totally safe and then he gasses up Hermes by basically saying like who are you because you're super young and you're super attractive and your parents are super lucky to have you which again Odd conversation considering they are in the middle of nowhere. Hermes actually asked Priam in this moment how people in Troy are dealing with Hector's death. He's just like, what are they doing? Are they all abandoning the city? Like what's going on? And now Priam is like, okay, well, who is this guy? And, and who do you happen to be if you know who my son is so well that you can reference him by name and know that he's important enough in my city that people would be reacting to it. So Hermes does not say that he's Hermes. In fact, in this moment, he says that he's a henchman of Achilles. And that's how he knows who Hector is because he saw Hector fighting and and all of this and now he he has seen Hector in death basically is what he says which catches Priam's attention obviously it catches Priam's attention and he's like if you really are the henchman of Achilles can you tell me where my son is is he you know being eaten by the dogs is he by the ships is he being honored what is going on Hermes comforts Priam right now and he says that actually his son is not being eaten by the dogs because it's clear that the immortals love him Hermes is just trying to tell him that like look your son is okay. It's been 12 days, yes. And Achilles does definitely drag him around Patroclus's tomb more than he should. However, he's not been scraped up. Like Hector hasn't been scraped up. His body's in pretty good condition. Like you would think that he just died on the battlefield with the way that he looks because the immortals love him. Priam is elated by this and he's so happy by it that in fact he offers Hermes a gift of a cup, like one of the ransom things, it's like this goblet. And he offers it to Hermes and he says, I'm gonna give you this thing, this is a gift. Uh, one, thanking you for telling me this information and two, for you to be a guide for us back to Achilles' ships because Bear in mind, that is the whole goal. And so he tells Hermes that that is the goal that he has, but Hermes has to refuse the gift. Hermes is like, Achilles is a scary man, okay? I cannot just accept a gift without him knowing that this gift was even offered to me. However, I will guide you back to the ships. I will bring you to the Greek side, but I cannot accept the cup. Please don't offer it to me again. And with this, all three of the men jump into the chariot and we have Hermes who's standing at the front. He picks up the reins. He breathes all of the strength and this courage into the horses that are in front, obviously dragging the chariot, breathes all the strength into them and leads them up to the fortifications of the Greeks. Now this is important because there are obviously guards at the fortifications of the Greeks, but Hermes drifts them all into sleep so that they cannot see who is passing. They then safely pass through and get to Achilles' shelter. So they sort of like pull up next to the shelter and Hermes hops out and he basically outs himself as being Hermes to Priam and Priam's like, what? I never saw this coming. So he outs himself and he's just like, Zeus sent me down here. You're safe. No one knows that you're here. Make sure that no one knows that you're here. But he also says to Priam that he has to go into the shelter alone and not with the herald. He has to go in alone and he's got to supplicate Achilles. So he's got to go and like clasp his knees and talk about Achilles' father and Achilles' child in the hopes of moving his heart and his spirit and making him sympathize with 
uh, Priam a little bit more. And then Hermes leaves. That's Hermes' job done. He then leaves. Priam is now alone in the Greek camps with his, well, with Ideaios, whatever the hell his name is. But he now has to go into the tent by himself. Priam now jumps off the chariot and he leaves his herald to guard the chariot whilst he goes inside to the shelter. And when he goes in, he finds Achilles is sitting away from the majority of people anyways, because he's still sitting with Alchemist and Automedon, but he's kind of, he's even away from both of them, like they're just sort of near him. So Priam walks all the way over to him. He then gets down on his knees, bear in mind, nobody has seen him come in. So all of them are like, whoa, okay. So he's now down on his knees and he starts like supplicating Achilles and he starts like kissing his hands, which Homer notes are the manslaughtering hands because these are the hands that literally killed all of Priam's children basically. And now he's sitting there like kissing them and like trying to get Achilles to give Hector back, which is like honestly insane for Priam to be doing this. Like this takes a lot of balls. Priam's supplication is to remind Achilles, just as Hermes told him to, to remind him of his parents. He's like, please remember that you have a father who's like super old, just like me. Like, <laughs> think of me like your dad, please pity me. But also he highlights how he had 50 sons before the Greeks actually came to Troy. He had 50 sons, 19 of which were from the same woman. Holy crap, Hecuba deserves an award for having 19 kids. But all of the other sons were from uh, different ladies. And Priam now says that he's come for the best of all of his sons because that is who Achilles killed. He says, Hector was the best of all of my children and I really need his body back. Please take pity on me as a father. Also considering now I am literally kissing the hands of the man who killed all of my children, which is something that like no other mortal has ever had to do. Achilles then stands up and he sort of pushes Priam away from him a little bit because he's kind of in shock in this moment. And it makes him cry for his dad, thinking about Peleus, but also cry for Patroclus. He's just like very, very emotional still. And also we have then Priam on the floor who is crying for Hector. So it's like a crying fest in the shelters right now. When Achilles calms down a little bit though, he does say to Priam that it must have taken him a lot of bravery to actually come to the Greek camps. And in fact, he tells us this little thing about how Zeus has these two urns, like literally on Olympus, he has these two physical urns and inside one is sort of sprinkled uh, evil and good. And in the other one is just evil. And he says that his father Peleus has gotten a lot of the evil considering that Peleus, he lived a noble life. He's married to a great woman. And yet he has had only one great son who is now miles away from him in Troy and cannot care for him. Hello Achilles. And so because of that, he does really feel for Priam because he thinks that Peleus is probably doing the same thing back home and like crying for Achilles. But he does encourage Priam not to sit here and cry too much because he says your mourning isn't gonna bring Hector back. But he does encourage Priam to take a seat and Priam is like not happy about this. In fact, Priam says to him, please don't make me sit down when I know that my son is literally outside with his face down in the dirt. Like I can't do that to Hector knowing that he's out there. So he begs Achilles to just accept the ransom so that he can take Hector home. He's like, I don't really need to be here for any longer. And Achilles, Achilles looks at him darkly. That is literally the word that's used. He gets kind of mad and he looks at Priam and he just says, look man, I know that you were clearly accompanied by a god because there is absolutely no way that you could have gotten down into this camp. You couldn't have made it through the fortifications without the help of a god. And also because my mother Thetis literally came down to tell me that you were coming and told me exactly what I had to do. But I told you to sit down, don't insult me in my own home. Is basically what he says. He doesn't exactly say the end part, but that's sort of the general gist. And in fact, him saying this in such a stern tone terrifies Priam. So Priam's like, okay, what seat am I sitting in? And as he takes his seat, Achilles gets Automedon and Alchemist, who by the way, Homer does note that since Patroclus died, these are like his two favorite men, Achilles' his two favorite men at this point. And uh, he has them go out and unpack the wagon first and foremost, but in the wagon, he does leave two cloaks in there and also a tunic so that, that way when they bring Hector's body back on the wagon they have something to cover him up with so those are left there. After this Achilles then gets a bunch of his serving maids to then pick up Hector's body but they have to sort of do so out of the way of Priam's eyeline because they know that if Priam sees what Hector has been lying like and how Achilles has treated him he's gonna get mad and if he gets mad he might then make Achilles mad and if Achilles gets mad he might then kill Priam and this is like not a good chain of events. So the serving women take Hector's body and they take it up to be cleaned they anoint him with all of the correct oils all of this and then they go to then have him put in the wagon which then Achilles and Automedon and Alchemist are the ones who actually physically put Hector into the wagon, which I think is important because it shows the respect and it shows that Achilles knows 
that he has to do this thing in order to, to present himself as being like, okay, here you go, here's your son, you're welcome. When Achilles has put Hector's body into the wagon, he then has a moment to himself where he calls out to Patroclus and he basically tells him not to be super mad with him because he says, I know that I said I would, you know, destroy Hector's body in order to honor you. However, because he's come here to supplicate me, please don't be mad that I'm actually giving the body back and I'm allowing him this burial and I'm allowing him to have a moment with his son. He then goes back into the shelter and he says to Priam, your son is now in the wagon. I put him in there myself and you'll see him at dawn. But for now we must eat because this is a very normal hospitality thing to do in ancient Greece. So he's like, you have to eat here. And, and I know that you're really, really sad and everything, but even Niobe did not forget to eat when she was in mourning. So we must eat now. Now, for those of you who don't know, the myth of Niobe is long, it's quite tragic. And Achilles does tell us a very basic gist of the myth where Niobe is this woman who had 12 kids. And she basically boasted that because she had 12 kids and because Artemis and Apollo, like the God, Artemis and Apollo's mother Leto only had two, she was more fertile. This is a legitimate myth. And so obviously Apollo and Artemis were not happy and they killed her 12 children. Artemis killed all the girls and Apollo killed all of the boys. And so she was in a massive amount of mourning and Achilles uses this to say even she was eating So you're gonna eat Achilles does a whole sheep sacrifice They then eat and then Priam is a bit like okay Where's my bed because like now I'm like ready to sleep He does highlight to Achilles right now that he hasn't actually slept eaten or drank anything since Hector died Which was 12 days ago. So I'm definitely calling bullshit on the no drinking thing. Like there's no way that you haven't drank in 12 days, you would die Priam, but that's what he says. So Achilles is a bit like, cool, we'll have your beds made out on the porch. Now the reason why he's gonna put them out there is because he says that men throughout the night constantly want to have counsel with Achilles. So he says, if any man comes in here and sees you in like a pullout bed in the corner, then they're not gonna be happy. And they are also gonna try and like kill you or capture you or whatever. So if we put you outside, then it's easier for you to then escape and, and get away when you see a chance to go through the camps. Because once again, the men will come and they will see and they will not be thrilled. And Achilles does a really nice thing right now where he asks Priam how long Priam will need in order to bury Hector correctly. So he says, how many days do you need? Tell me and I will accommodate that because I will then be able to keep the Greeks from attacking you if you guys need X amount of days in order to correctly honor Hector, which obviously Priam is kind of taken aback by. And so he explains the process to Achilles that he'll need. And he says that for nine days, they will have to gather all the timber for the pyre and they will have to, you know, create this whole pyre. It's gonna take them nine days to do this apparently. On the 10th day, they will then finish their mourning for Hector and they will then burn him. On the 11th day, they will bury him. And then on the 12th day, everybody can resume fighting. And so Priam says, I know that that's kind of pushing it, but if you want the correct amount of time to honor somebody in death, that is it. So give me 12 days and we can start fighting again on the 12th day. Which Achilles says okay to. And then he tells them to go out to sleep on the porch where there have been two beds that have been made up. So the two men go out onto the porch and Achilles then goes to sleep inside the shelter. So it's nighttime and everyone is asleep. Greeks, Trojans, gods, everyone except Hermes. Hermes is still awake because he is terrified of how he's gonna get Priam out of the Greek camps without anybody seeing him. And so because he's restless, he goes down to where Priam is sleeping. He sort of like stands over him and he's like, yoo -hoo, I'm back. He basically tells them that they have to leave like now because if anybody wakes up and finds them there, then they're And so Priam is a bit like, okay. And so they then all hop in the chariot and then they leave. That's very long story short because they leave up until they get to the river Xanthus where then Hermes basically leaves them by themselves and says, you guys are close enough to Troy. You guys are totally safe now from the Greeks. Have fun, bring your son back home. So they ride up to Troy and the only person who sees them is Cassandra who then calls out to the rest of the city and is like, my father is coming back with my brother. Everybody come and watch on as if he were alive coming back from battle. And so everybody runs up to the gates, everybody runs up to the walls and they are like lamenting and mourning and crying for Hector as he enters the city like behind Priam and Iadeios, whatever the fuck that guy's name is. So they're all crying as they're doing this. And in fact, Andromache and Hecuba come right up against the wagon and are like grabbing at his, his face and grabbing at his head, grabbing at his hands as they all walk him back to the palace. When they get back to the palace, they put Hector back in bed and they're all crying and wailing and the singers are near him. So they're sort of the undercurrent of the wailing. So they're encouraging everybody to wail. But then we have three women get up to speak in honor of Hector in like the last couple of lines of the entire book. Like we're now there guys. So Andromache gets up first and she looks over Hector and she's crying. And in fact, she's nearly screaming. 
and she just says how much she misses him. She says that he's left her a widow. She says that he was the greatest of all of the Trojans, that everybody loved him, but that she's now been left by herself. And her and the other women in the room will now have to go back to the Greek ships. And maybe his son will, she says, maybe, unless the Greeks decide to throw him from a tower because he will never be able to rule over the city now that Hector is gone. And in fact, one of the saddest things that she says is that she wished he had died with her so that he could give her these last, like, intimate words, but she has nothing to hang on to in his death. And all day and night, she mourns for him. And it's honestly, anytime Andromache speaks, it is heartbreaking, I won't lie, but this time in particular, as she's looking over Hector's body, you're just like, oh my god, my heart isn't ready. Next to speak is Hecuba, where she says that Hector again has died far away from home, and that she knows that Achilles has dragged him around Patroclus' tomb a bunch of times, but she notes that you would never guess. She's like, you look as if you have been killed by Apollo's gentle arrows. I love that description that she gives to him. But uh, that is apparently how perfect he looks in this moment, how beautiful he looks, and how pristine Hector looks. And, and she mourns, and this encourages everybody else to keep mourning and to keep crying. And the last person to speak in the entire poem is Helen, which I think is a really interesting choice that, that Homer made, that the last active speech bubble is hers. So Helen looks over the body of Hector, and she says that he was her favorite. Of all of her Lord's siblings, Hector was her favorite because he was always really, really kind to her. And she says that she never heard anyone in all of Troy speak an ill word of him. And she knows that if anybody spoke an ill word of her, he was the one, not Paris, he was the one to tell people to stop doing that and to encourage them gently to be more respectful of Helen. And so she thanks him for that in this moment. She says, you're a really great, like you're a really great guy. She says that now is the 20th year she's been in Troy. That is a very important note, but she's been there for 20 years and that he was her only friend inside the city walls. And that is where Helen's little speech ends. And everybody continues to mourn, everybody continues to cry. And Homer leaves us with the last part of the book of the preparations for Hector's burial. So he walks us through that Priam had had all of the men, asked all of the men to go and pick up the wood. So they all go get the wood, they bring it back to Troy, they then do burn him, they then have everybody go and pick up his bones, they then put the bones and all of sort of like his dust basically into a casket. They cover the casket with a beautiful robe and all of this dressing, they then bury him, they go back and they have a feast in Troy. And the last line of the book, I wrote it down because I wanted to make sure that I got it right. The last line of the entire poem is, such was the burial of Hector, breaker of horses. And that is the end of the Iliad. That's it guys! Can you believe we just summarized the entire Iliad? This is insane to me. This is the longest series that I've done and I feel like the reception for this series has been so good. So thank you guys so much for loving the Iliad as much as I do, for really finding value in these videos, and I hope that they have helped you. I hope this whole series has helped you love this poem as much as I love it, and if you don't, then I clearly didn't do a good job, but hopefully in the future we'll be able to come back to it at some point so that, you know, we can, we can encourage everybody to keep reading it and encouraging everyone to love this story and to love these characters, because it truly is just a timeless tale. So thank you guys, honestly, from the bottom of my heart, thank you guys so much for every single like, every single view, every single DM, every single comment that you guys have left on these videos. This whole series has meant the absolute world to me because this is my favorite um, Homeric poem. So thank you guys so much, and we'll be seeing you next time on Moaning with a, a whole new series and a whole new topic. But um, yeah, thank you guys so much.